Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, this is the third time I've been to Gillette. Uh, energy is very important for Wyoming. Uh, Wyoming is the second largest energy producing state in the United States, just behind Texas. So if you add up all the oil and gas we produce in this state and coal, uh, we're actually uh, number six or seven in the world in terms of energy production. So there's a lot of a lot of BTUs in the ground here, and there have been some very big changes in energy markets uh, just in the past couple of years. And uh, this has been um, prompted by some revolutionary technology in the extraction of oil and natural gas. And um, the, this slide set actually is uh, my first cut at a book project, and uh, I'm still kind of wrestling with the name of the book, but um, it will either be fracking, blessing, or curse. Uh, here I have the shale revolution, blessing, or curse. Uh, the bulk of the slides are organized in the four parts. The first two parts is basically a primer to get you up to speed on what is the nature of shale energy production how is it produced? Why is it different from conventional oil and gas production? And then uh, just a rather pedestrian tour of the production process. What does it look like? What are the steps of the production process? And um, this sets the table for understanding the economics of uh, shale energy production, not just for the producers who are doing this to um, earn a profit and return those returns to their investors, but for the broader economy. And uh, in just the past couple of years, we have seen rather momentous changes in energy markets in the United States. And uh, these changes are affecting the macro economy. Uh, kind of give you a flavor for how momentous these changes are, some are viewing the United States as the next Middle East when it comes to energy, all right? And we'll see some of the numbers behind that. And then I will look at uh, the environmental impacts. I have a paper coming out in um, the Journal of Environmental Geosciences I published in Meteorology, Economics, Environmental Sciences, and, uh, and this paper uh, does a very careful analysis of incidents in the Pennsylvania Marcellus, environmental incidents. And so we'll draw some lessons from that. And then uh, uh, here, uh, just kind of give you uh, a sneak peek at my conclusions, the bottom line. What, what, what's my, I've studied this area for about four years, fracking and so on. Is it a blessing or a curse? I think it's both. And I think uh, whether it's a blessing or a curse depends on who you are, where you're working, and who you're representing. And uh, there's no doubt this is a disrupt, disruptive technology. Uh, there was an economist named um, Schumpeter, Austrian economist, and he characterize capitalism as the process of creative destruction, all right? When there's a new industry, that puts other industries either out of business or reduce sales. In my mind, there, there has been an extremely polarizing debate over the environmental impacts of so-called fracking. And if you look at the facts, there are environmental impacts. Despite, uh, some say, there have been no environmental impacts associated with fracking. Well, maybe that's technically true, but there are environmental impacts from oil and gas development. There are environmental impacts of just about any human activity, in particular industrial activity. So it's really important to quantify, and this is what environmental economists do, we quantify the impacts and we value them, all right? And uh, in my mind, I think a lot of these impacts can be managed with proper regulation at the state and federal level. And uh, the 
there are some real economic dislocations occurring due to this shale revolution. We're seeing it right here in July with the reduction in coal shipments. It's directly tied to shale gas development. I'm gonna make these links. But again, if you look at the numbers and you do the analysis, the benefits appear to be over, uh, overreaching or larger than those dislocations. So on net, I think, as a society, we're better off if we properly manages, manage this uh, process. All right, so what is the nature of um, shale production? What is shale production? Shales are a group of um, resources under the ground uh, that are tightly packed deposits from ancient history, uh, decayed plant and uh, uh, animal matter. And in oil and gas, there are essentially two types of deposits. There's conventional deposits that where the hydrocarbons, the, the methane or natural gas or the petroleum, come to the surface driven by forces under the ground, either pressures from gas or pressures from water. And most of the great hydrocarbon reserves that have been discovered in history, many of which are still under production, about 35, 40% of world oil production is, is coming from fields that we discovered more than 50 years ago, all right? And those fields are pressurized initially by this gas and water. Literally, the oil and the gas come flying out of the ground. Unconventional deposits, however, don't do that. You need external pressure to produce the oil and gas. And these uh, unconventional oil and gas resources are very abundant. They're all over the world. There's a principle in mineral, mineral economics, and this applies to copper and oil and so on. It's called the resource, resource triangle. I was just talking with Bob about this uh, earlier this morning. On the very top of the triangle are high quality resources. So for instance, Neolithic miners in Switzerland were mining copper that was 20% copper by weight, all right? Now we mine copper where we get maybe one-tenth of one percent copper out of a ton of ore, all right? And it happens, this applies to oil and gas resources as well. We use the good stuff, easy to get oil and gas first, and then we start going for the more difficult deposits that may lie under the ocean or are uh, distributed in rocks in, in a very abundant way. So as you go down the triangle, the size of the resource base expands and the technological requirements increase and the costs increase. And this is very, this is the move from conventional to unconventional resources is just a move down that triangle. All right, and what are these unconventional oil and gas re resources? Shale, in fact, you can see shale deposits on the, uh, the cuts on uh, I-80 and interstate highways back east. You'll see black rock, that's shale, okay? And, um, uh, and out in western Wyoming, uh, the, the, the tight sands, uh, where it was an area where horizontal drilling was perfected more than 30 years ago, okay? Uh, and many view these uh, unconventional oil and gas deposits as the source rock for a lot of oil and gas, okay? So under what we're finding as we, you know, there's an adage in the oil and gas, in the oil industry, the best place to find oil is in an oil field. All right, because there's so many pockets, there's so many levels, um, there's still a lot of oil in the ground. So we're using a lot of advanced technology to extract these resources. Now what is this technology? I mentioned one, horizontal drilling. And this is, I still, when I go to uh, sites and I see this, it's hard to see because it's underground, <laughs> all right? But think of a pipe about four or five inches in diameter, about a quarter inch to a half inch thick, steel pipe 
being drilled into the ground a mile down, and then they kick it out. They bend the pipe and then drill horizontally. In many cases, more than a mile, actually, uh, there's a company that uh, has uh, perfected a technique of drilling up to seven miles horizontally. Okay? You can actually drill on the beach and get offshore oil using uh, these technologies. And then the other key technology is hydraulic fracturing. And I've got a diagram of that explaining exactly what that is. As the uh, terms, uh, uh, as the term implies, hydraulic water, and it's water under pressure, and the water is used to fracture rocks to increase the permeability or the, and the rate at which you can extract uh, oil and gas. Here is a picture of uh, a vertical well and these fissures that emanate from the well are the fracks. And these fracks, first the well is drilled and then it is fracked. And the first step in the fracking process is to insert explosive charges in the uh, well bore. It fractures the rock initially and then, and there's multi-stages of these fracks, and then water is pumped down. Uh, and it depends on the well and the location. Millions of gallons, three to five, six million gallons of water are used on a typical frack job. And the water has suspended in it sand particles. And these sand particles are called propens. And they're called propens for a reason because the water goes in, it carries the sand into the cracks, and as the water is removed, some of the propens or sand particles remain behind, propping open the cracks. It's a pretty ingenious process that was developed over, you know, this wasn't invented overnight, it was perfected over a 15 year period by a, a company down in Texas. Uh, Mitchell Energy, who sold out to Devon, and they developed the great Barnett field, and this is the Barnett shale. You see the dark layer. This is a hydrocarbon-rich deposit. And here is pictured a hor on the right a horizontal well. And you will typically see a mix. If you go back five years, maybe 40% of all wells were the vertical wells because they're cheaper to drill. It's only about a million dollars a well. And these horizontal wells are more complex to drill, and they may be anywhere from five to eight million dollars to drill. Okay? Now, I mentioned uh, Mitchell Energy. Um, they developed the Great Barnett Field in Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas. And literally, this field is under a major metropolitan area. There are gas wells. I've seen pictures of gas wells in the middle of a cul-de-sac in a suburban neighborhood. Okay? And that's the level of development. Thousands of wells have been drilled in the Barnett. The uh, other big producers, uh, there's, there's a handful of shale plays that are major producers, the Barnett in Texas. Uh, the Fayetteville in Arkansas, uh, the biggest one right, well, the biggest one last year was the Haynesville Bossler in East Texas and uh, Western Louisiana. And the biggest one right now is the Marcellus. I wrote a report about four years ago entitled The Emerging Giant, and I just did the math and said uh, that uh, the Marcellus could be the largest gas field in the country within a few years. And uh, it was a fairly controversial report, but it's coming to pass. Uh, you can see the extent of the Marcellus. I mean, look at the map. It's about the size of Wyoming. Um, and uh, not only is the Mar there's the Marcellus, there's two other shale plays above and below the Marcellus. Uh, and we're just kind of scratching the surface. 
There are also a number of very promising shale plays in the west. The Niobrara is in our backyard. It extends uh, through eastern Wyoming and northeastern Colorado. And uh, as we'll see, uh, the, you know, when we go to this theme of blessing or curse, uh, the success of shale gas producers has sort of sown the seeds of their destruction because prices have collapsed for natural gas. And a lot of producers now are shifting to drilling for oil in these shales. And this is the so-called tight oil, okay? It's oil embedded in shales. And the Eagle Ford is a very hot shale oil play right now that's going into production. And then there's the Great Field in the Bakken, which now is producing upwards of a million barrels per day in a relatively short period of time. Uh, actually, this past year, 2012 over 2011, we have seen the largest increase in U.S. oil production in recorded history. You have to go back to the 1930s when the Black Giant came on stream in East Texas, where you see a multi-hundred thousand barrel increase in average daily oil production in the country. So this is very significant. And, and the the uh, discovery of so-called shale plays, both for gas and oil, are proliferating around the world. We're finding big plays in Argentina. There was just a discovery in Australia, China, Poland, Russia, and so on. Okay, now, unconventional gas production is different than conventional for the geologic reasons I mentioned. But there's a production profile that's quite different as well that has a lot of economic and financial implications, incentives for, for drilling. And this is tied to the production decline curve for these resources. In a conventional field, you'll get a bump in production and a slow tail and it will extend at a relatively high level for a long period of time, okay? But for a shale well, you get tremendous production up front and a very steep decline. So production declines 50% within the first couple of years and then it levels out. And actually there are some shale wells in western New York that were drilled over 120 years ago, that are still in production, producing small amounts of methane. So what this means is, from a financial standpoint, if you're an investor and you're putting down five million dollars to build a well, and you just multiply these units of production by the price, you're getting all your money up front. It's very attractive. Okay, you do the internal rate of return on some of these wells and it's like 50, 60, 80 percent, even at relatively low natural gas prices because everything's coming out very quickly, all right? And this provides an incentive for companies to go out and drill these wells. Now, the other dynamic that's very important about shale gas and makes it different than unconventional is that, and this, this relate, uh, the best way to relate this is uh, a personal story. I did a study some years ago where I first got into this area for a company drilling for deep gas in upstate New York, all right? And this stuff was down 30,000 feet. It was in the Trenton Black River Formation. And it was a typical tight gas play. It wasn't shale, but it was, deep gas, and I uh, went to, I was going up to the company uh, headquarters in Horseheads, New York, uh, to make my presentation, and I went on the internet and saw that the company announced the discovery of a well that came in at 30 million cubic feet per day. And, and I got to the corporate headquarters, I met the company president, 
And I said, congratulations on, on such a great find. You guys must be, feel that you're really sitting pretty insecure. And he lowered his head and shook his head and he said, yeah, but with the decline curve, we have to keep finding these wells, all right? And he said, it's like a treadmill, all right? You have to keep drilling. So this is, this is the other aspect that follows from this decline curve. And you can see this in the way these companies operate. They, they operate in a very, they have a very different strategy. It's sort of like statistical drilling. They drill a lot of wells and keep drilling. It's almost like manufacturing and, and, and produce uh, uh, gas. But none, nonetheless, there have been a lot of innovations, especially in Pennsylvania, and it's spreading elsewhere. Uh, Multi-stage fracking is, is really has made a difference. And if you look at the numbers at some of these Marcellus wells, they're coming in 30. There's one that came in at 40 million cubic feet per day. That is a lot of gas. It's almost like wells that you would find in the, in the Middle East. And it's due to these techniques that companies have developed in fracking and completing the wells. So there's more gas and fewer wells uh, need to be um, uh, drilled. Now, you remember the map with the various shale plays, the Barnett, the Fayetteville, the Haynesville, the Marcellus, now the Niobrara. What you typically see in some of these shale gas plays is a rush to go in and lease land, okay? And then following that uh, leasing rush, there's a drilling rush because a lot of leases have an expiration date. In other words, drill it or lose it. So companies will drill rather uh, at, at a rapid pace, and as they bring the wells online, production will increase at a very rapid pace. And this is a plot here of wells drilled to total depth in the Marcellus. And you can see the wells, uh, this is quarterly wells. It basically, the rate of drilling quadrupled over um, a two-year period, okay? Uh, you know, a 24 month period. So they're ramping up for this full scale uh, drilling effort and with it uh, production. And, uh, you know, I remember three years ago uh, talking with one of my co authors and, he said, and I, I asked him, he's an engineer, and I said, Bob, what are we going to do with all this gas? You know, it's going to lower the price. And he said, well, we'll export it. And, there were preliminary engineering studies done three, four years ago thinking about reversing the pipeline flows, and sure enough, it's happening. Pennsylvania is now exporting gas to Canada, eastern Canada, in a very significant way. Uh, so production, at least from the Marcellus, is increasing um, much more rapidly than anticipated. That's no guarantee it will continue in the future. Now, here. A quick tour through the energy, uh, the um, shale energy production chain. And this is important to kind of get an idea, a perspective on the environmental impacts and also the economic impacts. Here pictured on the right is a cartoon from Vanity Fair magazine uh, circa 1860. And you can see there are whales at a cocktail party. And they're toasting the advent of rock oil. And rock oil, crude oil, replaced a biofuel, whale oil, uh, for lamps. And so the whales were very happy then because uh, they were very few in number uh, after uh, the slaughter to uh, supply the, uh, uh, the illumination business. Now, in the leasing activity, um, the uh, first step is to obtain rights to drill. And one of the very significant differences in the United States from other countries in the world is we have something called private ownership of mineral rights. All right? And they either come attached to the deed for the land or detached. 
but they are owned by private individuals. If you go to Saudi Arabia, who owns the oil? The king, the royal family. If you go to Australia, minerals under the ground, under terra nullis in the center, the outback. Actually, a few years ago, it was the crown, and it's part of the big dispute in the Republican movement in, in, in Australia. Who owns the minerals? So what does private ownership uh, provide? Incentives for monetizing the assets. In other words, developing the property and making a profit from it. And in this rush to gain access to uh, the right to drill on someone's private land, you have landmen coming in. And uh, landmen are, uh, you can, they're generally colorful figures, very gifted in persuasion, and they get people to sign on the dotted line on a mineral lease where they get a bonus up front, and they get a monthly or annual check for leasing their land, and then if drilling occurs, they have an arrangement where they can get a percentage of the gross receipts of the well called a royalty. If you ever did a title search, it's very painstaking. People don't make, uh, keep very good records, so lawyers and legal assistants are employed in this process. A lot of real estate brokers uh, are also involved in this step. Then the next step, once the land is leased, and a, a lot of communities are, I've, I've given this talk uh, back east because ironically, the, I, the oil industry started in Pennsylvania, but many people in Pennsylvania have been unaccustomed to how the oil and gas business works. And uh, after the land is leased, you may see these strange looking trucks and crews stringing out wires around the, uh, on the ground doing seismic surveys. So the crews come in from outside, they're uh, put up at local hotels, and uh, they start mapping uh, the, the resource through seismic uh, technology. And then their first real ground is broken. Here is a picture uh, of a well being drilled. Uh, and typically, it, uh, the, uh, and, you, know, you can see the deciduous hardwood trees. Uh, and uh, you know, Pennsylvania gets, uh, Pennsylvania is very different from Wyoming. Uh, there's about 50 more inches of rain per year. <laughs> uh, uh, there are trees growing everywhere. Uh, and uh, uh, so land has to be cleared and uh, uh, the typical well site is about three to five acres, and a lot of businesses are brought in. And what's interesting, I, I've thought about, I've compared energy development from different sources, you know, wind and solar and oil and gas and coal, and a lot of these uh, oil and gas operations require local businesses. Why? Uh, because the, a lot of the materials and supplies are are very difficult to outsource to foreign suppliers. So if you want sand and gravel for your well site to build roads and a, and a well pad, you need water for the frack, transport costs are very important. So you're going to go to uh, local uh, contractors for that. And, uh, uh, and then the next step here is the well construction. So you clear the pad, you clear the site, you, when uh, the drill bit hits the ground it's called a spud and that's when the counting begins and uh, uh, the, uh, five years ago it would take five to six weeks to drill a well. Now these companies are getting so proficient at it uh, they're doing it in two to four weeks. Uh, and uh, you can see the range of businesses that are used uh, here. Uh, there's a lot of steel pipe that's used to construct a well. Think of a steel pipe a, you know, a couple of miles long. That's a lot of steel. Adds up when you're drilling thousands of wells. Uh, so the, the US steel industry is very happy right now. They're seeing increased business. 
Also, uh, there's quite a bit of concrete and uh, cement that's used in the casing of the well. And uh, many, you can see 125 tons of concrete per well. And many companies, drilling companies, contract out their services uh, to uh, perform these uh, activities. Then once the well, here pictured on the right, is a well completion going on, all right? And notice there's no derrick, all right? The well has been drilled. And now, and you also notice uh, what appears to be semi-tractor trailers around the, the uh, center of the area, which is the well, okay? And on those flatbed trailers are big hydraulic pumps that run on diesel fuel. And actually, one of the uh, major environmental impacts of well stimulation or fracking is, are the emissions from the diesel equipment. About a, a range of estimates, anywhere from 12 to 18,000 gallons of diesel fuel are used on a typical frack job. Okay, that's a lot of diesel, it's a lot of emissions. Uh, and uh, a lot, quite a bit of sand, so much sand uh, in the Marcellus, this has proved a boon for the railroads in bringing in sand from uh, other areas. So again, and, and also water. And then finally, you can see once the well is fracked and goes into production, the footprint is relatively small. It's about an acre uh, or less. And uh, here you, can, you see on the uh, right two different types of wells depending on the level of liquids that come out. Uh, the bottom one has three tanks next to the well, and the one up top is probably a dry gas well that has minimal liquids that uh, are. And environmental regulations in Pennsylvania and many states are very stringent on how the vegetation should be restored. Uh, the access roads and, and so on. And in fact, a lot of uh, the violations, environmental violations that occur are due to improper restoration of, of, of sites. And then, so that's the, you know, that's from uh, the drilling and preparation of the well to the production of natural gas. But it doesn't stop there. And this is perhaps one of the more significant but uh, unrecognized aspects of the shale revolution. And, uh, and one in particular is uh, something called wet gas. All right, there's dry gas and wet gas. Now what's wet gas? Wet gas is gas that has a higher thermal value than dry gas. Dry gas typically has about a thousand uh, British thermal units, heat equivalent units, per thousand cubic feet. Wet gas may have up to 1,300. So what's the difference? Well, there are chemicals, hydrocarbons, in that wet gas that makes it wet and makes it hotter to burn. Propane, for one. Butane, isobutane, pentane, and ethane. And it's sort of a cocktail. And there's an ingenious process. There's actually a great company in uh, Denver, Mark West, that specializes in building plants that process this wet gas and cracks this wet gas through temperature and gravity to separate out the various fractions. So we can get you know, the propane that you use on your grill to grill your steak is probably from one of these processing plants. I say probably because refineries of plants that convert crude oil into gasoline also produce propane as a byproduct of that process. Okay? And here pictured on the right, or, uh, on the top panel, is a gas processing plant. And you will see those. You see those out west, and you see them back east. And these plants cost depending on the size, anywhere from 25 to $125 million to build. It's a lot of steel pipe. Again, it makes the steel guys happy. And it converts 
this wet gas or strips this wet gas of its useful products, which are then shipped. And that creates a transportation problem. You know, like in real estate, they say it's location, location, location. In energy, it's transportation, transportation, transportation. Transportation is very vital. We can see it here in Gillette with the railroads and the coal industry. It's very important for oil and gas production, much of which is transported out by pipeline. Okay, and pictured on the bottom right is a, a pipeline under construction where you can actually see the pipe. And uh, uh, so uh, we'll see in some of the numbers coming up, there's been a big increase in pipeline construction in the United States, a lot more people involved in that business than in the past. And then finally, uh, <laughs> there is, uh, well, uh, I met, this is just uh, another picture of the uh, gas processing plant. And, uh, and then finally, we have the downstream industries that use these products. So the shale revolution has essentially increased our production of dry natural gas, and it has significantly increased these natural gas liquids like propane and ethane. And uh, we'll see it's also being applied to oil, and it's increasing our oil production in the United States. And I had mentioned the United States, some investors and outsiders saying, hey, the United States is going to look like the next Middle East over the next 15 years. And what are they thinking? Well, they're thinking of using all these hydrocarbons to make stuff, not just burn things, but make stuff. And uh, pictured on the right here are uh, an ethylene cracker and an ammonia, uh, anhydrous ammonia plant. I can't remember which one is which. Uh, I'm an economist, not an engineer. And, uh, and there is a considerable investment underway to produce, and produce new ethylene plants in the United States. And this, these are plants that take ethane and propane and convert it into a, a product called ethylene. Now, what's ethylene used for? Ethylene is used to make plastics. And uh, you remember the 1968 graduate uh, movie, The Graduate, Dustin Hoffman's By the Pool. And he's an 18-year-old, and he asks the, the elderly fellow, what should I do? And the father said, plastics. You know, and, and he was right at the time because the plastics industry went from nothing to a $50 billion industry overnight in the 50s and 60s. It's still a very sizable ind industry. Most of the stuff we see, we're sitting on. Plastic, it's all around us, okay? And it's coming from hydrocarbons. So petrochemical manufacturing, fertilizer production. If you look at the profitability of making fertilizer and hydrous ammonia in the, in the United States compared to other countries, we're about as profitable as some of the natural gas um, rich areas in the Middle East. Ergo, United States being the next Middle East. Uh, very profitable to make soap. Groups are saying, hey, let's make anhydrous ammonia here in the United States and use some of this natural gas. Metal and glass industries that use a lot of heat are also looking to expand their use of natural gas. There's a process in steel manufacturing where you, uh, you can, about half of all our steel in the United States, actually it's about two thirds of the steel produced in the United States is from recycled steel, okay? Sustainable economy. And uh, so much so that the price of scrap has gone up because the Chinese are buying a lot of scrap. We're the number one exporter of scrap in the world because we have so much stuff, all right? Our junkyards are being picked clean by the world. And uh, there is a scrap substitute called directly reduced iron that's been around for years and it's been produced in small areas with very abundant energy supplies, natural gas in particular, like Trinidad. And now companies are deciding to locate those plants in the United States because of this abundant natural gas. And also, uh, another uh, industry that uh, has been expanding their use of uh, natural gas are the fellows who produce electrons. 
the electricity producers. And this has been both a, it's, it's a classic example of economists saying trade-offs. This has been good for natural gas with expanded sales. It has not been good for coal. And in fact, uh, coal has really taken it on the chin because of this switch and other factors like environmental regulation. Also, there's been a lot of talk and move now to use compressed natural gas in cars and buses and trucks. And typically, this makes sense if you have a vehicle that you run a lot, you put a lot of miles on it, and it gets terrible gas mileage. The penultimate example of this is the garbage truck. It gets about five miles to the gallon, and a lot of municipalities are converting those trucks from diesel fuel. It's very expensive to burn to natural gas, and they're saving lots of money. Fleet vehicles and so on. There's CNG filling station networks under consideration, I think development. And also, liquefied natural gas is being looked at as a fuel for trains and ships. And this also has a cost advantage and also burns a lot cleaner than petroleum-based fuels in those applications. So, all of, so you get the picture here. It's stimulating investment in downstream industries. And we're just sort of on the start of that. And uh, it's starting to uh, uh, gain favor and speed. Okay, now, in uh, developing shale resources and looking at the economic impacts, there are basically four categories that I'd like you to uh, keep in mind or consider. First, the, the idea, when we're talking about um, the development of a new industry like shale, it involves a lot of investment, okay? Now, why is investment good for the economy? And, you know, we've heard this in, in general terms, you know. It, it's, it's important to get business investment spending up. Well, investment sets off a, a virtuous cycle where one firm buys goods and services from another firm, all right? And this investment may come from outside the United States or from savings in the United States. But most importantly, it stimulates business activity in other basic industries. It also, if you look, I, I've done some careful analysis of um, how shale companies spend their money. And what I found is, and I thought, well, they're going to spend it on steel pipe and sand and water. Actually, a very significant fraction of their money is spent on services professional services, business services, engineering services. I've got some data on that. So that's an example of how this, uh, why this matters, you know, why this is important for, for our economy. Uh, so it, shale investment directly expands employment in the oil and gas industry, and we've got hard numbers on that to show. Uh, but it also expands employment in a lot of supporting industries. And this is why basic industries like manufacturing, where we make stuff, real tangible goods, or we produce fuels in the mining sector, are sort of hub industries that feed service industries, okay? Uh, you know, theoretically, we could all subsist by giving each other haircuts and drinking lattes. But when it, the real value added is generated in a lot of these basic industries. And then, um, and I mentioned the, the uh, limited outsourcing uh, possibilities here. But the real kicker, and this is where I think the revolution comes in. You know, that when you're talking about revolutions in markets, it's where prices change. Um, prices change to such an extent that people start to consider things that were unheard of before, okay? A good example of this is gas to liquids technology, natural gas to liquids. So, and there, there's been, there have been technologies around since the 1920s. In fact, Hitler's Luftwaffe was a coal to liquids operation. They powered those planes from liquid fuels derived from coal, and this technology can be used in fact, there's a plant just west of Laramie, apparently is uh, under development, to produce 
10,000 barrels of gasoline from coal and the natural gas to liquids. And there have been a couple of big announcements of building gas to liquids plants in the United States. 100,000 barrels of oil, or gasoline, diesel per day from natural gas. Uh, and that's, no one ever thought of this just five years ago. This is how revolutionary this is. Uh, the price of natural gas uh, has plummeted to such a low level that it has brought down the price of electricity in traded, uh, in open traded markets such as the PGEM, the Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland power pool area where there's a real time auction for electricity. And uh, this has been um, having major ramifications for investment in renewables now because now the marginal cost of electricity is so low it's not making these investments uh, viable. Uh, I mentioned the big induced switch from coal to natural gas, and we'll, we'll see some numbers. Uh, the, pr the primary reason coal shipments are going down here in eastern Wyoming is because of this switch that's going on, the low price of natural gas. There are other reasons like environmental regulation, but natural, low natural gas prices. Uh, and so we have, again, Going back to the blessing and curse, all right? Uh, we got the blessing of lower natural gas bills for con consumers, but on the other hand, we, get, we have some industries like coal that are, are facing some uh, difficult times. And uh, I mentioned the induced investment. Now here, I'm gonna run through some uh, data and charts, kind of give you a, a feel for, uh, the major changes that are occurring in, in, in energy markets due to the shale revolution. And here we have pictured the Baker Hughes rig count. And this is, you think of the rigs, you think of those derricks, and that's a drilling rig. And a, the company Baker Hughes is a well support company. They track, they've been tracking uh, rig counts for decades now. And here plotted are the, the rig counts for the past decade. And you can see they went up they're essentially on an upward track. This sharp decline in uh, 2009 was due to the collapse in oil prices after the Great Recession. So in July of 2008, the price of oil was about $145 a barrel. And by the spring of uh, 2009, it went down to $30 a barrel. And uh, when the price of oil, in the United States, if the price of oil goes anywhere below $60 to anywhere in that range, 50 to 70, you get a big drop in the rig count because it's suddenly less profitable to drill for oil uh, and also uh, natural gas. Natural gas prices also plunged during that period as well. Okay, now, I mentioned the increase in gas production. Now this is an interesting chart. There's a couple of things going on here. Three things going on, three bars, three sets of bars, three things, all right? The uh, greenish, I don't know what that color is, uh, greenish yellow here, right here, these big bars. This is total dry gas production. And you can see measured in billion cubic feet per day, it went from about 52 to 63 in uh, four years. Uh, pretty, pretty healthy increase. Uh, much of this, but if you look at the other two sets of bars, the red bars are non-shale gas, okay? This would be conventional gas. And you see that has gone down. Now why is that going down? Two reasons. Main reason, depletion, okay? And that's the thing to keep in mind about oil in particular we lose about three to four million barrels of deliverability each year, million barrels per day of deliverability in oil each year due to depletion. But we offset that with new discoveries. And over the past five years, world oil production has been essentially flat because the new discoveries are just keeping pace with the depletion. Also, Price has, a, has something to do with this because price, the high price has dampened demand. And we'll see in the United States, the demand for petroleum is down significantly 
in just the past four years. Now, how has total gas production gone up? It's from the shales. Notice, 5 BCF per day in 2007 to 22 in 2011. That's a four-fold increase. It's a huge increase. In just, and again, it, you, know, you may say, oh my God, how did that happen? It's because of the decline curves, and they're bringing on all these wells that are producing like gangbusters. Okay? But if you stop drilling, it's going to catch up with you. Production will start flattening out. Prices will come up. All right, now here's a production, here's a diagram of production by shale plays. And you can see the Barnett is already sort of leveled out, okay, in production. The Haynesville has, that's the one down in Louisiana, has come on in a big way. And the Marcellus is now ramping up in a very major way. Uh, kind of give you an idea. I've done a well count. And uh, at the end of last year, there were about 2,000 wells producing in the Marcellus. And there's about another 2,000 that have not been hooked up yet. And I, uh, you tell me when they're going to come on stream, but there's a lot of gas uh, in the future. And so uh, there, there have been, uh, the Woodford, by the way, is down in Oklahoma. And, the, uh, and I mentioned the Eagle Ford, which is producing both dry natural gas and uh, wet natural gas. And here we have... Uh, uh, a diagram of crude oil and natural gas liquids production in the United States from 2007 through October of 2012. And this is measured in 1,000 barrels per day. Okay, so the United States was producing in 2007 slightly over 5 million barrels of oil, crude oil per day, along with another 1.8 million barrels of uh, natural gas liquids and liquid refinery gases, okay? And uh, by uh, just uh, this year, production now is up 1.3 million barrels per day. And that, this is total production. This is offsetting the natural decline in many fields. So we're finding more oil then we're losing through natural depletion through the application of these new technologies. Liquid uh, NGLs, as it's known, has also gone up about a half a million barrels per day. So probably at this time, we're up two million barrels per day in a four-year period, in a five-year period. That's a very significant increase in production, and no one would have. Uh, predicted this five years ago. In 1980, when I worked at the Congressional Budget Office, I was their gas guy. Uh, I, I wrote a report that was mentioned on, I got a lot of high fives for this. Dan Rather on the CBS Evening News mentioned my report. And I, I remember talking with uh, the, the conventional wisdom at that time was we were going to run out of natural gas in the United States. Okay? In fact, the Congress of the United States passed a law banning the use of natural gas to generate electricity. It's called the Fuel Use Act, all right? My, how times have changed, all right? And I remember talking to a shell geologist at the time, and he said, don't believe it. There's a lot of gas in the ground. There's something called in-field drilling, where you drill more wells in the field, and you get a lot more gas. Again, where's the best place to find oil or gas? In an oil or gas field. It's, there, there's a lot under the ground. Okay, now, I mentioned the employment story. This very busy chart with lots of numbers plots direct employment in the oil and gas industry by segment. There are various segments of the industry. As my little supply chain il illustrated, there's drilling, extraction, support, equipment, pipelines, distribution, pipeline construction, refineries. If you add all this up, you can see the level of employment in the oil and gas industry 10 years ago was slightly over 600,000. And in 2012, it exceeded 1 million. So there's about 400,000 more people working in the oil and gas sector uh, over the past decade. I remember, uh, 
vividly in the 90s that oil and gas in the United States was considered a sunset industry. All right, it was just going to be phased out and we're going to do haircuts and lattes and, you know, uh, Amazon.com, you know, and so on. Oh, that was a great, you yeah, know, that's fine. In fact, a lot of the tech, you know, has been applied to oil and gas because now because of compu uh, enhanced microprocessors, we can do computations in geoscience that we couldn't consider before, and that's been an enabling technology. So direct employment is up. These are hard numbers, not modeling results. And here is a pie chart of an analysis of accounting data I did from a sample of companies. We, we got these horrendously large ledgers, uh, tens of thousands of lines long, down to what piece of paper they bought and equipment and so on, all their suppliers. And what strikes me in all of this is you look at the left of this diagram and it's primarily the service sector, okay? Transportation equipment leasing, legal and engineering services, 7% of spending, 6% on technical consulting, uh, all other professional services, 17%, it's about 40% total up on services. Okay, so uh, this is one thing, uh, I, and I've, I've struggled with this with uh, my efforts, uh, my studies with the steel industry. You do the same analysis of the steel industry, you find the same thing. These basic industries that produce stuff support services. And so the service sector is, is um, benefiting from uh, development of basic industries. Here's a plot of unemployment rates in uh, shale producing states. This is a little dated from September of 2011, uh, but you can see back then the US unemployment rate was 9.1%, but in most of the shale producing states, uh, we had below that in unemployment rates, uh, especially in places like uh, North Dakota. Uh, here's a finer grain analysis. This is a map of Pennsylvania. The dots represent drilling and the color coding represents um, departures of the county unemployment rate from the statewide average. So if it's green or green shading, the unemployment rate is lower than the statewide average. And you can see the clear association. Uh, I always, when I look at a map of Pennsylvania, I always remember what um, James Carville, uh, President Clinton's political advisor said of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia with Alabama in between. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that, you know, that is a very insightful uh, comment about the social and cultural acceptance of oil and gas. And the communities in this part of the country uh, really welcome the oil and gas industry. I wouldn't say with open arms, but uh, they were receptive. And in fact, a lot of farmers in Pennsylvania have gas wells in their backyards that they power their house and their equipment with. So uh, they were um, quite familiar with the operations. But the, uh, the point here is that when you have a lot of drilling activity and investment activity, the local economy booms. Now it can turn to bust and it is turning to bust, but you had the boom, okay? Uh, also, a very similar relationship can be mapped between drilling activity and sales tax revenues, which are very important for some various states. And the ones in uh, red indicate that they saw increased revenues. And by the way, this was a period of recession in Pennsylvania. And uh, a lot of the Southeast Pennsylvania and Western Pennsylvania were suffering and the shale producing counties were be benefiting. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, here is, I think, one of the real indicators of a revolution. And I mentioned when relative prices change, all bets are off, hats are changed, relationships are changed, new strategies are uh, developed. And uh, here, it's on, really kind of on the tail end of this chart in, in just since 2009 we had oil and gas prices heading in opposite directions. 
And if you go back and do a statistical analysis of uh, the relationship between oil and natural gas prices over the past 50 years, this spread right here between oil and gas prices is way, way, way out. It's like five standard deviations from the mean deviation over the entire sample period. One, it's showing that there's a tremendous profit incentive to, to use that gas to make oil, all right? Alchemy, <laughs> turning lead into gold. Uh, and, uh, and two, it, as an economist, it's screaming arbitrage and there's gonna be a closure. So either gas prices are gonna go up or oil prices are gonna go down or some combination of the two. Uh, here is just a diagram of some modeling work. Uh, I'll skip that. And um, here is uh, some data that illustrates the abrupt change that lower natural gas prices have on our pocketbooks, okay? I buy natural gas to heat my house and cook my food. Uh, companies, uh, producer, uh, Pizza companies with ovens, gas-fired ovens, although I prefer wood-fired pizza, uh, use natural gas, prices come down, their expenditures go down. You can see the very sharp reduction, and in, the, in that middle line, it, that there's an odd color, green, yellow, um, is industry. And you can see that industry expenditures on natural gas plunged because a lot of industries have contracts tied where they buy natural gas tied to uh, the open market price of gas. Okay, and then finally, uh, the petroleum balance here. This is a very insightful chart. Uh, the red line is domestic uh, consumption of petroleum products, and you see it's down about 4 million barrels per day. Very significant reduction over the past five years. And as a result with this, so we're lowering our petroleum consumption in the United States and increasing our production. So our trade balance is dramatically improving. We run a trade deficit in the United States of roughly in the vicinity of a trillion dollars a year, okay? And we can get away with that because the world sells oil in dollars, all right? And I don't know how long we can get away with it, but a big trade deficit acts as a drag on your economy. And uh, we're starting to narrow that. The next chart illustrates that. Here we now have, and this is another aspect of the revolutionary change that's, that's going on. Uh, here the green line indicates the trade, the net imports in dollars uh, that we spend each year for oil in the United States. So for instance, uh, in 2009, uh, the US economy spent over $300 billion on imported oil. Now that's $300 billion we could use in this country. And just think of the multiplier effects, multiply it by two or three, uh, if we spent that money here in the United States. That's come down a bit, all right? But the trade balances for petroleum products, coal, and um, natural gas are now positive. Uh, we're net exporters of coal, petroleum products, and natural gas. Uh, and then finally, here's the picture on coal, where uh, this in 2012, we have about a 6% 6 6 reduction in U.S. coal production, a 14% reduction in consumption, but about a 16% increase in exports. So export markets are helping us out, but not all the way. Okay, uh, unfortunately, I don't have enough time to go through the environmental impacts. Um, uh, and we can talk about that later. I refer you to uh, my paper. And uh, just some conclusions here uh, so we can have some lunch. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, 
a lot of the controversy around fracking and shale production has occurred in the east. Uh, the thing to note is that uh, environmental opposition is a business. And uh, also uh, a lot of environmental opposition is funded by competing industries. And uh, so it's a very interesting uh, uh, phenomenon that's going on. That's why we live in an open democracy. We have debate. But you will see these problems when you have large-scale energy production in close proximity to a lot of people. And that's one big difference between producing oil and gas and coal in the West versus the East. Think about Wyoming, a major oil producer, a major energy producer, producing in proximity to 90 million people. That's the Marcellus, okay? So you're naturally going to have not my backyard concerns here. Uh, the economic benefits of this shale revolution, I think, are significant. The economic dislocations are also going to be significant. There's going to be a shakeout. There's going to be a rearrangement of assets, not just in the energy industry, but in a lot of downstream industries. But on net, my, my analysis and belief is that um, the net benefits are positive, especially if we have good regulation, insightful regulation to manage the environmental impacts, which are there. You can't deny them. It, it happens with any um, industrial activity. So with that, lunchtime.